everybody welcome back to another episode of the evolving activist i'm lauren morn and today is january 28th 2020 and there's a reason why i'm putting a date stamp on today's episode uh last year at this time in the evening it's right about 10 p.m right now um on january 28th 2019 i was at the equine vet hospital with my mare gift and i was being told by the vet team there that they didn't think that they could save her life um and so today's episode is devoted to gift this is gift she's so beautiful she's perfect in fact gift is a wonderful amazing resilient creature gift is is gift is my why and i want to tell you a little bit about her on this anniversary of her survival so i met gift back in 2009 when i was volunteering at a local horse rescue called serenity equine rescue and rehabilitation and um she came in pregnant and nursing a colt and um, she had been through some pretty bad stuff. I'm not going to talk about it now. She's passed it and it's not part of her. It's, it's part of her history, but it's not part of who she is anymore. Um, but suffice to say that she had had more than a rough trot. She had had a, 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 an incredibly traumatic run. And um, she arrived at the, at the, the rescue, like I said, pregnant with a with a foal and um also still nursing a young colt called cody and um this was a horse who was so traumatized that she couldn't abide human touch she couldn't abide contact um she you know we weaned her we weaned cody from her and he joined the 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 yearling pod at the point at that time he was probably only about five or six months old and um started learning to to be an independent little dude and he, he still is an independent little dude he's awesome he was actually adopted by my friend vani who is also a gestalt coach like i am she partners with cody in her work but at the time we had this mare who was pregnant with this foal and just absolutely wanted nothing to do with human beings human beings had done really badly by her and um, so eventually it was time for her to have this baby and she would not have the baby she would not she was so she was so traumatized she was so concerned that this was going to be the end of her life that uh, it took a while for, for us to help her feel safe enough to actually foal her second son, Lightning, who was an amazing and, and beautiful boy. Um, after she, I mean, she was a great mom, by the way, as well. She's a very pragmatic horse and very, very good at, at what she does, whatever she puts her mind to. Um, but, you know, Lightning was adopted and Cody and Gift were still at the rescue and still at the rescue and still at the rescue. And three years later, they were still at the rescue. And um, she was still barely tolerating human contact. She hadn't had her teeth looked at. She hadn't had a vet check. She hadn't had her feet done because she simply wouldn't tolerate it. She would allow a few of us to stroke her cheek for a second before being overwhelmed. and. Um, flipping her butt towards us. And um, she, was, she was basically a horse that a lot of people said, look, you're never gonna rehabilitate this mare. You're never gonna rehabilitate her. You should just put her down. And that's not something that we did. You know, we said, if she, if she can't be rehabilitated to the point where she can tolerate human contact, then she can just be in sanctuary here. But there was something about her. There was something about her this, this sweet, stoic, strong mare who had been through so much 
and I'm gonna tear up just just even thinking about her. Um, and I thought, you know, I wonder if she could just be given a chance to trust somebody, would that make a difference? And I was, you know, I was living in a condo in Seattle at the time. And one of the reasons I was volunteering at a horse rescue, as opposed to the, the animal shelter, the, the small animal shelter, was because I thought, well, you know, I live in a condo. <laughs> And if I volunteer at a horse rescue, it's not like I can just, you know, adopt the horse and go home with it. <laughs> anyway, long story short, I ended up renting out my condo and I ended up renting a house and fostering Gift and Cody with the purpose, the whole sole purpose of finding them homes, getting them to, to be um, good adoption prospects. My my personal goal was I was going to go back to Australia after a year of adopt, of fostering them. So um, that was a big year. It was 2012. And I was living in this house, fostering this beautiful girl and her adorable cult. And I was so happy. And we were making progress, very, very slow progress. I would start by just standing with her while she ate, you know, progress to um, holding a brush out for her as she would walk past, kind of letting it just slide across her skin, um, showing her a halter, but then not putting it on her, things like that. And she was slowly, slowly coming around. And then my dad died and my whole world turned upside down. And I disappeared for a month. I, I left and I went to take care of things with my brothers. Um, and I went to Australia because I was like, it's, you know what, I have to start getting this in, in, in progress. I have to start looking, going back, seeing if it's, if it's a good place to go back to, seeing if I can find a home and a job, et cetera, et cetera. And so my roommate looked after the gift for a month. And, you know, he was also a volunteer at the, at the, the shelter. So he was, he had had experience with her. He, he was exceptionally good with horses. And so he took care of her for a, a month while another friend of mine very, very kindly fostered the cats for a month. And, um, you know, I went to Australia and I thought it just doesn't feel right to move back right now. So I don't think I will. And I came back to the U.S. And um, Gift welcomed me back. And as a gift to me, I believe, she took a really big step forward in her rehabilitation. And that, you know, first of all, let me just share something. Um, I was in a deep, deep grief. I was close to my dad. Um, he was kind of the, the, the gravitational pull of the family. He was, he was my North Star. And he died very suddenly in an accident. And um, I was kind of lost when I came back. And something that, that happened with the horses, both with Gift and Cody, but then also with the horses at the rescue, was when I would go in with them, they would gather around me that gather and stand with me and just be and just stand together with me it was it was incredibly sacred and incredibly healing to just be in their presence and have them acknowledge and have them literally come and surround me with their presence in that state of deep deep grief that i was in um, and I'll never forget that. It was, it was so powerful. And, and then she made this big step forward in her rehabilitation, which I, I truly believe was, was um, an offering from her to me to, to help me heal um, as much as for her to say, I know you're back and let's work together. Anyway, about the same time, um, you know, a, a couple of years before I'd been introduced to, to animal communication, I hadn't really done anything with it, but a friend of mine had sent me um, a flyer for 
an animal communication workshop by Joan Ranquet, who is my animal communication teacher, amazing woman, energy healer. Um, and that, the month after I got back, I went and did a weekend workshop with Joan on um, death and dying. And basically, you know, one of the things that Joan works with very, very, very strongly, very, very well is, is, you know, in order to be a good animal communicator, you have to get out of your own way. You have to, you have to deal with your stuff and, you know, so that you're not coloring anything that comes through. And of course I was in this incredibly raw space and the death and dying workshop was incredibly powerful. Uh, it kind of felt like I'd been through like seven years of therapy in a weekend. <laughs> um, but one of the things that we were doing at one point in another part of the, the workshop was working with animals that we, you know, that we were, that we had in our household and um, having people in the class talk to them. And so I had bought photos of Cody and, and Gift and I said, you know, I'd like to, to find these two horses a home. I'd like to find them, you know, a, a forever home. And so my questions for them were, you know, can you help us understand what kind of a home you really want what kind of a um a life are you looking for you know do you want to be a sport horse do you want to be you know a pasture pet do you want to you know do you want to be with a family with children those sorts of things and uh, cody was cody was pretty clear he was just like i want to be part of someone's family i want to be i want to be their heart horse and gift on the other hand was squirrely she was super squirrely <laughs> And so we kept asking her, you know, what are you looking for? And she'd say things, random things that didn't make sense, right? Like things like, well, you know, it would be good to, to go new places, see new things. Um, and I'm thinking, this isn't helping me find you a home. Until Deirdre, the girl who was talking with her, said, Gift, do you want to stay with Lauren? And she said, well, of course. And the whole room of, of students kind of swiveled around and stared at me and said, well, you have yourself a horse. And I was just, no, <laughs> no, I don't want a horse. Um, that's a really big commitment. And I don't do commitment. And Gift said, commitment, commitment, you know, let's just see where this goes. And <laughs> so um, in her typical indubitable way, um, I said, look, I'll, I'll think about it. But I, 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 just, I just don't know if I can do this. Well, as the universe would have it, um, a month after that class, Patricia, the lady who runs the horse rescue, came and had coffee with me at my house, came and visited Gift, and um, we'd found Cody a home by then with Ronnie. And um, Patricia said, you know, there's something about you and Gift. And I feel... I feel really drawn to offer her to you, to waive the adoption fee and to offer her to you um, and to invite you to offer her a forever home. And well, who am, I, who am I to say no to the universe? I mean, really, it just happened that way. So in the end, Gift adopted me and we continued our journey together. Um, healing each other because there were th some things that I was still working through, right? She was working through. We were developing this really special bond and um, this beautiful, beautiful horse was just such a great teacher. She, she's very stoic. She's very independent. She wants to retain um the the wild essence of herself she 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 holds herself independently um and at the same time she and i love each other very very deeply so anyway long story short we didn't i didn't move back to australia funnily enough seeing as now i had a horse in the family but we did move down to new mexico and that was um that was an interesting journey you know she was not used to being trailered um she was amazing 
And while we were in New Mexico, uh, she had her first brush with death. She had a, a, a gastrointestinal um, episode that really, really um, was pretty serious. It happened very fast, got very serious very quickly. And she survived it. She got better. And we met Fella, the beautiful, sweet, sweet golden Palomino boy who adores her and is her, I call him her, her prince consort. Um, and then we moved to Kansas and then we eventually came back to Washington. And the day she got back to Washington after a 30 hour trailer ride, she colicked really, really badly. And that was rough. That was, that was a few nights of, of sleeping in my car down at her, down at her, her pen, um, watching her, having the vet out multiple times. But she recovered from that. She has become such an integral part of my life. And something that happened when I was in New Mexico was I got introduced to the Equine Gestalt Coaching Method program by Touch by a Horse by Melissa Pierce in Colorado. And I thought, wow, that'd be so much fun. I just started my coaching business. Um, you know, I thought it'd be really kind of awesome to, to, to get involved with that. What I liked about the program was that Melissa is very clear about the fact that we're partnering with the, with the horses rather than using them as tools. And that, um, that the foundation of that relationship is, is holding the horse as sacred and a sacred partner um, who has free will in the process. So I was like, this sounds good. I think I'll enroll. But I don't know. You know, I don't know if I, I, I want to be working with people. I kind of want to just like maybe move into energy healing and just do that for the animals. Um, I don't know if I, I want to, you know, work in this way um, and gift in a communication session was very clear with me she she essentially sent me a very clear message that said you can't help your people well you can't help my people she said you can't help my people until you help yours and the essence of what she was saying really resonated with me right I want to help animals. I want this world to be a, a kinder, more compassionate place. And one of the, the, the populations that is most subject to violence and oppression and exploitation are non-human animals. And so um, I wanted to really help them. Well, the point that she was making was really clear. Human beings are the ones who do the abusing and the exploiting and the oppressing. And human beings will never stop doing that unless we help them come home to their heart and their compassion, right? Human beings as a species are in grave need of healing and, and returning to wholeness. And so I sat with that and I thought, she's right. She's right. If I can help people reconnect with their compassion if i can help people heal if i can help activists avoid burnout a heal from trauma then i am helping the animals and if i can help the people then i'll help her people too the animal nations and um and you know every time i think about oh Maybe I won't be a coach anymore. Maybe I'll go back into the corporate world and just do a job. Every time I think that, I'm reminded of the fact that she said this. If you want to help my people, you have to help yours. And so with that, I enrolled in the Equine Gestalt Coaching Program. I, I, I stepped into myself as a gestaltist. I stepped into my, my calling as a coach. and. She has been the most beautiful partner in the work, the most beautiful partner. She is so drawn to people in pain. She's so 
empathetic and she's so compassionate and I just she's my why she's the reason I do what I do she is what keeps me going who keeps me going when things get rough and things get hard she is the one who inspires me and her resilience and her ability to move past everything that she's been through has always humbled me it's always brought me back to the path so last year when i walked out to the pasture to bring her in for the, the, the night and found her down and when the vet said you need to get this horse on a trailer and get her to the hospital because I'm afraid she's not going to survive the night. And when we got her to the hospital and they could barely draw her blood, it was so thick. And the vet said, I don't, I, I haven't, I, I don't know if I can save your horse. I don't normally save horses who are in this bad of a condition. My whole universe stopped. I was so helpless. This beautiful, beautiful being that I loved so much and I was completely powerless to do anything for her. And she was so, so sick. She had contracted an, what they call endotoxemia, which is basically systemic toxicity, right? Usually what would happen there is the vet said, that would usually be caused by uh, a twisted gut that had basically cut off some of the gut and become necrotic. Um, in some circumstances, they may be able to fix that with surgery. She was not a candidate for surgery. He said, if we put her in the operating suite, she will die. Um, another way that they can get it is through chronic colitis, which causes significant leaky gut. She didn't have that. She was perfectly normal at nine o'clock in the morning. And at death's door, literally, by five o'clock in the afternoon. Um, we, we couldn't figure out what had happened. We didn't know. The examination, as far as they could tell, there was no gut necrosis. We didn't know what, what, had, what had poisoned her. She hadn't eaten anything different. She hadn't eaten anything different from the other two horses that were turned out with her. Uh, we hadn't wormed her. It was, it, was, it was a mystery as to how this horse had suddenly gotten so deathly ill. And all I could do was stand there and say to the vet, that's not an option. It is not, like, not saving her is not an option. Um, and so I checked in with Gift and I'm like, what do you want us to do? And she said, if you'll fight, I'll fight too. And I said, damn straight, we're fighting. <laughs> um, the vet said, well, this could be really expensive and you might not have a horse in the morning. And I said, thank you, American Express, because that's exactly what you're here for. And I told the vet to do what he needed to do. And he did. She had multiple plasma infusions. She had medications by drip. Um, she had, you know, all sorts of things going on. Um, and they were also worried about, you know, in a situation like this, they can obviously also founder, which is where they, you know, it, it, it's a, they get this laminitis in their feet. And frankly, if, if no, they, there's a saying that says no foot, no horse, right? And so had she founded, they would have had to to it was she probably wouldn't have survived that either so so she had a lot stacked against her but what she also had was an indomitable spirit she had a resilience and a resolve to fight she had a survival instinct she still had that wild essence that she's always held on to and and she had the support 
of people from around the world. We had, you know, Joan, my animal communication teacher, she, she and I were in contact constantly. She rallied her whole student base to send energy healing, do scalar waves, do, do Reiki, do all sorts of things, sending gifts, intention and healing and energy. I had people around the world praying for her, sending her good, strong intentions for healing. The, the doctor, the vet was doing everything he could. We were giving her, in addition to everything they were doing on an allopathic level, we were giving her homeopathy. I was giving her nutrition. And I was spending every spare minute at the hospital with her. I would sing to her. I'd share Reiki with her. I'd pray for her. And she went really deeply, deeply within herself. And she pulled on reserves that I don't think either of us knew she had. And a few days, about a week after she'd been in the hospital, the vet said to me, you know, I think she turned a corner last night. She wouldn't let us put her halter on when we'd been doing her exam after after doing her exam well she wouldn't let them take the halter off and i'm like that's my girl <laughs> she does not love to be handled <laughs> um and she looked a little brighter that day and then a few days later we'd had this huge snowstorm and i couldn't even make it out to the hospital so i had to sit back and just go with faith and the vet called me and he said, you know, I think she's turned another corner. I think she's going to make it. <laughs> and she did. She made it. She survived against all the odds. Against all of the, the experience that these vets who have worked around the world with, with multiple tens of horses, hundreds of horses, thousands of horses around the world, that these vets really, have, they said to me, you should rename her Miracle because we don't know how she did this, but she survived this and she's going to make it. She's coming through. And today is the, the one year anniversary of, of, of her going down of that, of that, the start of that, that journey. And there are some things that really came out of that for me. There was the acceptance. You know, at one point, I really fell into a deep connection with her and said, you know, if this is your time to go, I can accept that and I'm still going to fight if you're ready to fight. So that acceptance and that kind of, that kind of surrendering, I surrendered my need for her to be alive. I surrendered that. I surrendered my financial concerns. I honestly, I'm, I'm just grateful that I had available credit to cover her bill so that we could do for her what we needed to do. Not everybody has that privilege. I really, really, if I had had any doubt at all about the efficacy of intention and prayer and energy work, that would have been laid to rest because I fully believe that that played into this miraculous recovery. And the lessons that she taught, the lessons that she taught in faith, in resilience, in tenacity, in endurance, 
every time I want to give up, I think about the indomitable spirit of this horse. And I realize she's my role model. She's my why. She's why I do what I do. And I live in gratitude for the miracle of her survival. I live every morning, I see her and I think, thank you for still being alive. Thank you for still being in my life. And I won't stop doing what I'm doing. I will still live into this vision. I will still fight to help my people so that we can help yours. Because there's no force more powerful than love. And she shows me that every day. And so the point of this really long-winded teary rant <laughs> is to celebrate gift, to celebrate my partner in, in, in life and business, this wonderful, fabulous, magical, miracle mare, this beautiful girl. And to recommit To the path of building a kinder, more compassionate world for non humans and for humans. And to celebrate and be grateful and to not give up, to keep fighting all of those things. So, my invitation to you at the end of all of this is to consider what your why is. Consider what you feel you're here to do. And what qualities can you embody to bring that to life? What values can you live into? Who's your role model? Who's your inspiration? Because when we have a big enough why, we can endure any what, and we can always find a way. There's no how that is any match for a good why. And with that, I'll invite you to share your why. If you know it, share it in the comments. If you'd like to explore your why, contact me. Let's talk about how I can help you and how I can support you with that. And if you know your why, I want to invite you to recommit to it. If there's somebody who needs to hear this story, Share it with them. So with that, happy miracle anniversary gift. Thank you for still being in my life. Thank you for being the inspiration that you are. And for everybody watching or listening, I wish you a safe, happy and healthy day or evening, wherever you are. And I will catch you on the flip side.